Welcome everyone to episode eight of the Leaders in Safety podcast. We, we had a little bit of a small uh, break last week due to uh, isolation COVID uh, reasons, which is all fun and games, but uh, only one more day to go now until isolation finishes here in the, in the burn household. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have Catherine King join me on episode eight. Uh, Catherine is the Global HSC and Sustainability Manager, Alan D for ABB. So welcome, Catherine. Oh, thank you, Nathan. It's it's great to be on the call and uh, sharing a little bit about my journey with the uh, yourself and the viewers. No, absolutely, and, and and it is you know we are both currently in lockdown, so uh, we can sort of you know share off each other's thoughts here about how I mean out of interest, how's everything going in your household up in Sydney? Oh, um, we're a bit frazzled, um, losing track of time and day. But uh, I've got two two young kids and a husband that we're trying to you know school and. Uh, and uh, along with our own our own um, jobs, it's yeah, it's a challenge. And uh, it'd be great when it's all resolved one day. We, we were having a bit of a chat offline as to whose children will be the first to intercept this podcast. So mine are downstairs, uh, uh, mouths are taped. And they're I know. Handcuffed and, uh, no, yeah, no. <laughs> true. I know. I hope my kids don't come in screaming and complaining. There's no food in the house. Which, uh, which is mostly, uh, you know, something that they do uh, most days. No, absolutely. It only makes the podcast more natural, Catherine. So, but look, th thank you oh, so yeah, much no, for, thank you, for, for, for joining me. And look, I thought we'd just kick off by you giving us a quick overview of your career. Oh, thanks very much. So I started actually my career out as a, as a registered nurse um, in a big public hospital in, in Sydney. I'm a Sydney girl. Um, was in the role for a couple of years and I was afforded the opportunity to complete a maternity leave placement in the role of HSC for the hospital. So uh, that that 12 month stint, you know, I really fell in, in love with the role. Firstly, I was out of my uniform. So that mentally was quite uplifting. Um, and, you know, dealing with managers and employees rather than um, sick patients was also good for my psychology. But you know, I was challenged along the way, you know, with a, a number of projects, which I really threw myself into. And, and uh, I didn't really lose sight of that, that the continuing um, of my, my care, supporting quality health outcomes. It was just in a little, a little bit of a different place. So from there, I went back to university and studied a master's in HSC at New South Wales University. Um, I did a thesis on, on occupational stress for registered nurses, which has really held me in great stead, um, most, most importantly, more recently uh, with the COVID pandemic. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And now I'm in ABB, where I've been employed for eight years. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. Absolutely. I was actually doing a little bit of um, research there, just on your background too, because, you know, before ABB, you were with closures. My understanding of closures is the bottle caps on 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 um, yeah, products. yeah on and, and on yeah removing the the wine um, cork uh, to a uh, an aluminium, aluminium closure. But before that job, Nathan, I was with Coca Cola. Yeah, right, so I was yeah. with Coca Cola Hamilton, yeah, in New Zealand for three and a half years. I've done a stint in Rail as well. So Rail Rail Corp. I was there for five years. Um, and I've done a bit of consultancy along the way. Oh, that's so, really yeah, interesting. A, I, I, I think it's great when people have that sort of, I guess, opportunity to, to have the different industry experiences, you know, rail for you, then FMCG bottling, and then obviously ABB. I mean, on, on the topic of, of ABB, you know, it's a, it's a big global Swiss brand. I'm sure a lot of people will have heard of ABB and when they see the logo, but for those that don't necessarily know exactly who they are or what they do, or maybe their products, can you give us some insights as to what ABB does? Yeah, yeah, sure. So ABB is actually um, a Swedish Swiss multinational corporation, um, and you'll find ourselves ourselves in a hundred countries around the world, and we have a total of about one hundred and thirty thousand employees. And ABB has four customer focus leading businesses and about twenty one divisions, and we operate mainly in robotics, power, heavy electrical equipment, and automation technologies. And we typically manufacture the products, we install them and service them in the field. And we've got a portfolio of about 1,500,000 products and parts across the, the division. So it's very, very diverse. And in terms of, you know, where you'll find us, you know, you'll find us in the home. 
So we're, we have smart home technology. So you've got your, you know, your door entry systems, you've got your emerging lighting systems and blind controls. Uh, you'll find us in transport and infrastructure. So we're all through, you know, um, rail, road and marine. Um, and our products in those particular, um, uh, you know, uh, well, our products within those um, areas, you'll find us with um, low voltage and high voltage um, product systems, um, uh, you know, throughout, uh, you know, again, through, you know, gas, water, power stations, paper mills. Um, and we're also in the renewable space and more recently in e-mobility. So your EV charging stations. So for heavy vehicles and bus charging systems. So very diverse portfolio. No, that, that is, I mean, that is extremely diverse and, and, and somewhat complex, which actually really interested to, I'll circle back. I'll, we'll talk about a couple of things now, but I will circle back to that because what I'm interested to, to, to hear about is there's a really big complex organization there and, and your role being in a global role based in Australia with an overseas based company, it's going to be quite interesting to sort of, to hear about that. But what I thought I'd just ask first, Catherine, was, you know, over your career in those different industry sectors, what, what have you seen as being the biggest positive change to happen in the health and safety space? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Well, for me, I, I do really believe that the introduction of the safety culture movement in the early 2000s has really been a game changer in terms of shaping employees' awareness and desire to comply with WHS legislation, which is otherwise quite a, you know, a dry topic. Um, and, you know, following rules is not that engaging. So I think it's really been it lift, lifted that engagement. Um, I do also believe that communication through the hearts and minds storytelling, bringing stories to life through that authentic leadership um, has been a real boost to the brand for HSC and, again, engaging our employees. Creating a pool strategy in terms of delivering, you know, targeted training sessions, um, you know, rather than just that, that typical sort of lecture style of you must prescri in prescribing and following the rules, the culture piece has really, again, been able to move into more of an interactive way of, of learning and developing our colleagues. And culture has really activated company, company values. And, you know, all of our organisations, you know, have a, a set of company values. But that culture has brought, you know, care to life, integrity and inclusiveness starting at the very top. And just when we talk about the very top, you know, our CEO and the commitment of that top down leadership has really come to life through the cultural move, movement. And furthermore, I see the movement has really now started to involve, evolve into the safety differently movement. So I think they're one of the same. You know, from Sydney Decker and Todd Coughlin's teachings, we again move ourselves into a realm of possibilities in terms of innovation, driving change, and again, employee engagement, which in turn, in, um, you know, improves safety outcomes for all. What, what, what's, what's really interesting about all of that is you, it, it's, you know, you're in a bit of a unique role in the sense that you get to see positive changes happen, not just in Australia, but you've got a whole range of countries and regions and cultures, different ways of thinking, different ways of educating. It must be refreshing to sort of not just to see things on a, on a, on a, on a changing basis when it comes to positive changes. Do, do you find that different places are going through different positive changes? Is it more of a collective approach from a health and safety perspective? Oh, yes, it certainly is. The cultures within organisations, I didn't, I underestimated um, you know, what a challenge it would be to sort of, um, you know, engage with cultures uh, on, on their journey and sort of to get everybody on the same page. You know, for us in Australia, you know, our, um, you know, our, our informal, friendly, um, you know, upbeat personality um, has really put us in good stead in, in our, you know, engage, engaging on the topic of health and safety. And I think that's why culture's really been embraced. Safety culture's been really embraced in, in Australia because it is our, if you like, our, our personality, you know, mm. our, our friendliness. It's not the same in European cultures. You'll find that they're much more rigid, um, you know, much more formal. 
uh, and much more black and white. So that, you know, they, they, they typically, you know, like to follow rules. And, and so you have to adjust your personality and your approach and the way you engage them because of their, their traditional, um, you know, cultures, but also that, that the way they, they, they interact. It's very formal. No, absolutely. So I, which, is, which is what makes it exciting. Diverse. Oh, it's so great. It's so mm. great. And I, I look forward to telling you a bit more about uh, my role and, uh, you know, the, the, the advantages and some of the, the um, things that have been a challenge along the way. Just, just while we're talking about change, I mean, um, or, or things that have been positive, is, is there anything that still makes you frustrated as a, as a senior health and safety professional? Um, oh, look, it, it, you know, there are things that do sort of certainly disappoint me. And, um, you know, the, the assumption that, you know, compliance will always equate to safer outcomes, I think for me is where I struggle, you know. Uh, so we typically, you know, have a, a regime of, you know, follow a system, follow the rules and you'll, you'll be safe. And as we know, you know, compliance is really great and it is really necessary and it allows our people to follow the correct process. But however, by creating more prescription and more rigor and, and control of our organisation and our people, um, it really, for me, I think does um, potentially open up, up risk. Um, it, taking power and control away from somebody, um, you know, and, and, you know, makes them vulnerable, I think. And I think that's certainly the case um, when, you know, that they're in a situation when work becomes very challenging and very difficult. You know, when, when they don't feel empowered to make the right decision, um, you know, again, it, it really exposes them to risk. And no, this absolutely. is what I found. Yeah, you know, and, and you're career. touching on people there, which, you know, I, I guess in your role, having gone through not just the industries, but with AB being such a big business, you would have been in various situations where you had to build teams around you and, 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 and develop talent. You know, and, and obviously we'll touch on your L&D side, which I'm fascinated about as well, because obviously you're so passionate about that as uh, as part of your role. But, you know, what, 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 what have been some of the strategies or bits of advice you've had about attracting, retaining, developing people in your, your journey, Catherine? Yeah, well, it really starts, um, you know, through that recruitment piece. Um, you know, so a job ad, um, you know, I, I do ensure that the job ad really picks up on the type of culture that we have in the organisation and certainly um, the dynamic of the team. So really being able to spend time on a job ad, ensuring that you get the, you draw in the right applicant. And, and it's not just about skills and experience, but as we know, it has to be those soft skills. So, you know, getting into a, a situation within that recruitment phase. So, you know, I do definitely want to tease out um, and select a, somebody with the best skills and experience, but I do spend a bit of time on their soft skills, you know, their passion, their energy and their cheerfulness. And, you know, um, this can always be teased out through those typical behavioural type questions. But I also want to make sure that someone's prepared to do the hard yards and get into the trenches because as you know, safety is a hard slog. You know, there's, there's not a lot of glory in it. Um, and so to get somebody that's really being able to describe their experience around being resilient and tenacious, I think um, is really quite critical um, to being part of, you know, certainly my team. And then when it comes to retaining um, colleagues, you know, I it's really got to start with myself, making sure I do um, live and breathe the company values, um, establish that rapport and, you know, just being a good person through kindness and care for all and doing some of those really nice things that you do for your colleagues around their recognition and reward, you know, to make sure that they, they feel connected and want to be, be part of the team. And as you know, the happiest and the hardest working employees will always always need to feel that appreciation uh, for their efforts. And I, 
I do small gestures, making sure that I send them emails, you know, uh, of thanks and acknowledgement and make sure you go home on time and look after your family and how's your family going? No, Especially totally. The human, the human basics are sometimes just the best, Catherine. I mean, I, I, it's interesting when you, right. when you spoke at the start about the, the culture, I, you made, you started to get me thinking there that, you know, recently when, I mean, this hasn't sort of been a new thing for me, but when I brief candidates, senior people on, on roles, you know, the, the first 10 minutes is talking about the culture of the business. You know, what are they like? Making sure it, it sort of, you know, joins up with what their expectations are as people. They spend a lot of time researching it and looking into feedback on a company. So it's great to see how much effort you put into trying to, um, I guess, make it clear what the ABE culture is like and what you're looking for, because it really is important to people rather than asking about salary or asking about when's my next promotion or asking about the heavy details of the role culture 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 so it's it's good to see that that's a big focus of yours so yeah and i i really in my in my now my new role um nathan i really sort of drive that same type of approach um with you know workshops and, and speaking to senior leaders you know and really making sure that they really understand that authentic um leadership and being vulnerable is considered a, a leadership strength not a weakness is what you know, is really going to connect you um, with your with your with your teams, and especially now when you can't really see them so much because of remote work, it's even more imperative that you get that that those levels of communication going, and you know, make sure it's informal. Um, talk about the you know what what happens outside of work. Um, you know, make sure you you you're connecting with them on that level, and and they you know will it'll reap rewards. You know, they'll they'll be loyal, uh, they'll be motivated, they'll be empowered, and they'll do great work. No, interesting, Catherine. I very well said. I the, the, the we we talked about you know before the call we we're going to talk about influencing um, and 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 the the your role in in influencing the, the from the boardroom to the shop floor and. As we're talking about this on our podcast now, I mean, I, I think that what's really interesting to hear about is, you know, how you go about your influencing, given that you're in Australia, it's a European head office, it's a big complex organization, there's people in all sorts of time zones. And with COVID, it's all like this. It's all on teams, etc. How's it been for you in terms of being able to influence and, and, and how you go about it? I was interested to, to hear about that. Yeah, Nathan, um, it's, I suppose you know it, it's a skill that I, I am I am very good at uh, when it comes to networking and influencing and you know I'd only been in this role um, for a very short period of time but I was able to get the the ear of um, one of the very very senior managers in a particular business that I was working with on a, on on mental health and you know you must start at the top you must start at the top and establish that rapport with the most senior identity, um, you know, and work that relationship as mm. often as you can, whether it's getting into the lunchroom or the cafe and, you know, uh, you know, sitting next next to them, you know, being confident in, in, in your own brand and, and your offering, I think, uh, is all part of it. But, you know, when it starts at the top, that's, that's when it can really... Um, start cascading through the organisation. So, you know, with the CEO, I, you know, business planning, strategy meetings, um, informal chats around his or her ideas. And if you can convert those ideas into programs and actually give the CEO that recognition um, and reap some rewards that way, I tell you what, you've got a champion for life. And then just leveraging that through as many local initiatives as you can, whether it's walkthroughs, whether it's co-facilitating workshops, which I typically do with the CEO. Um, and again, I suppose it's got a, a sense of being, you know, that culture flavor and storytelling, but you know, they they can they really they really relate to um, safety um, you know much much better if it's on on um, not on their terms, but if it's their story. They're being authentic around their story and capturing that on video, um, injecting it into trainings, workshops, you know, everybody starts to get motivated. And I'm sure you know the expression, what interests the boss fascinates the team. So if they're doing safety, everybody else starts doing safety. 
Oh, and that's, that's great. That's yeah. Really, typically, mm. raising awareness, getting desire, uh, and driving the change, and getting recognition along the way. If it's award submissions, whether it's informal sort of, you know, celebrations with team members, you know, all those nice things that really boost people's mood, motivation, and empowerment is sort of the recipe that I like to sort of um, go with when it comes to influencing. No, great. And I think it's, it's, it's one approach and a strategy which I think works well across such a big organization like a lot of those things can be applied across cultures across geographics etc so um i i think that's a really i mean I hope, hopefully people listening to this who are in similar sort of organizations can take some some bits of advice out of that i drilling down a little bit into your specific role catherine um you know, you were leading HSC across Australia, New Zealand 18 months ago, and then moved into what I understand as like a, a global HSC L and D role. Yeah, how, how has that been in terms of what sort of experience have you had with this new job? It's so exciting, you know. Um, really, for me, uh, I uh, it's really my passion. I've really found my niche. You know, you the expression, you know, if you find your passion, you never work another day in your life. And I'm truly in that situation for me. Um, and, you know, long may it last. So I'm really playing to my strengths. So I'm quite a creative, innovative type of um, leader. And, and therefore, I love creating programs um, through the ideas and suggestions, whether it be the leaders, whether it be local staff, and whether it's through my, you know, my research and my, and my networks is really where my passion lies. And, you know, um, the, the, you know, in terms of the safety differently movement, you know, and learning about it and embracing it, it really has afforded me the opportunity to do some of that now in the new role. Um, I'm, I'm a really passionate about positive psychology and neuroscience, positive neurosciences. And I see that as really being able to, again, lift up the organisation in terms of a, a fresh approach to safety, which is really um, uh, certainly engaging for all. And um, yeah, this is, this is really uh, part of the role and part of um, what I love to do, not to mention building networks. So, you know, again, I talked a little bit about influencing a CEO uh, in country in Australia. Now I'm able to influence, you know, countries all around the world on a, on a global program. And I've done that more recently with rolling out um, the mental health uh, strategy across the entire world and just getting some of that uh, buy-in from senior leaders and, and videos and then being able to socialise that through different forums and business meetings has been so powerful. Mm. Um, and then to cascade it down the organisation, and I'm not, I'm not there yet, but uh, people are starting to use the language around mental health. We're talking about self-care. You know, you can't start a program if you're not looking about looking inward, you know, and uh, it's been so exciting to be able to touch so many countries but so many functions along the way. No, because we were talking, you know, off, off, off camera before about your most proud achievement and you, and, you, and you said the mental health initiative that you've been involved in. Um, is, that, is that something which has started recently or was it a couple of years ago? Like when, when did it start and, and sort of where are you at with that evolution of that project? Yeah. So I find it such a critical topic at the moment. It always comes up yeah. um, in, this, in these podcasts. Yeah, well, well, it started right from the beginning, Nathan, because I did a thesis on occupational stress for registered nurses. So it's it's really been in my my um, repertoire all along my career, to tell you the, pre the, the truth, and just care, care for myself, but care for my team, uh, whether it be mental health or, or physical health is 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 always what I've delivered on. But in terms of this particular project, I've started all around the world. I started um, in January of this year and being able to, you know, make sure that I'm across, you know, emerging best practice and then build a, a, a customised sort of module that's uh, a virtual offering, workshop style if you like, starting with managers and then move, I'll move into quarter four with employees has just been marvellous. And the spin-off from that 
is I've had senior managers coming to me saying, can you do workshops, um, more obese folk workshops for my team, mm. uh, starting with the finance. So the, the, the CFO of ABB has actually come to me and wanted me to come together with his leadership team to do a you know a bespoke program on on stress management and mental health for his team so it's early days but you know it's just finding those opportunities networking influencing uh socializing it and capitalizing on it is really um sort of my approach and when when, when you talk about lnd well well, my my, no my my memory i mean i was really fortunate enough to work with some amazing L&D heads and managers in, in my previous career uh, and previous organization. And, and, you know, they really, they were, they were great for so, so many different reasons. I mean, in terms of the young generation coming through and being able to sort of learn the, the, the skills of recruitment all the way through to more higher level topics, such as mental health or, or whatever the case may be. One of the things that I just remember them being very good at is running and facilitating workshops. Um, and and yeah. you your your career yeah, or your I'm role expert right? at that I was going to say you know <laughs> you must be and the facilitator. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and interesting um, that you say that because you know when we had um, co- well, I, you know, COVID's had some um, you know good experiences and it's had some really bad experiences. But but for my career, uh, it's it's been marvelous to actually embrace the virtual setting and learn so much about it to deliver virtual classes that you would think, oh my God, how, how, um, how disinteresting would that be? But to be, get that interaction going in a virtual setting is, is so powerful. And I do believe it's as good as face-to-face. So mm-hmm. I work off Teams, but we use the breakout functionality. I have a communication uh, platform called Mural where we can do whiteboards and, as I say, collaboration and polling using Slido and all those ways of activating participation, which sometimes you weren't able to achieve in a face-to-face because people sort of look a bit blank at you when you ask them a question. It's been powerful with, mm. with the virtual setting. And yeah, I've really mastered it. No, oh, that's that's great. I look, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll close on our um, on our podcast with with one final uh, question to do with a little bit to, with that. You know, I've interviewed a couple of people. Uh, it's now been I, I think you're the seventh guest um, who has had a a global role or or experience working overseas. There's been a couple of guests who've actually had global roles based nearly all in Sydney. I think um, one was with Cushman Wakefield, one was with Standard Chartered, yourself with ABB. Uh, and I'm always interested to ask them about, you know, the challenges with time difference, the challenges with the the, the bulk of the, I guess, the, the senior leadership team being more closer to head office, which in your case is Europe. But then there's the the language side of things. I'm just thinking, as you're talking about your workshops, I'm like, you must have an, sometimes an interpreter yes. in every country. How do you go with the complexity around that on all those topics, Catherine? Yeah. So when it comes to languages, I have to translate everything. So we chat, I'm translating all of my programs into 12 languages. Um, so, yeah, that in itself is a big program of work. So, you know, it takes longer when you're in a global role because you've got to you've got to um, consult sort of more people. Um, and you naturally would think, oh, is it just senior managers about permission to do something? But no, it's the technology. It's the number of translations. It's who's going to do the translations. It's the budget associated with that. There are so many nuances around what you have to sort of perfect before you bring a program to life is, is rewarding in the sense that, you know, if you, if, you, if you meet those challenges and accomplish those challenges, it's rewarding, but it, it's tiring and it's fatiguing. And when you talk about time zones, you know, you, in a global role for me, you know, my business is in Europe predominantly. So I'm on calls from, you know, 5 p.m. right through to midnight, pretty much five days a week. So I'm fortunate in the sense that I've got teenagers now that don't don't talk to me and <laughs> certainly don't want to talk to me in the evening. And then, you know, a, a happy husband. So it, it works for me. But, you know, if I ever talk to colleagues in ABB that are they're looking to go into global roles, you know, they, you know, they have to consider that 
you know, it will have an impact on the family. It'll have an impact on you in terms of your fatigue. Yeah. But, you know, you, if you get your rest during the day, you're okay. But it, it does change everything for your family. Um, oh, it does. Well, so, speak, yeah, speaking there, of family, there are we, we, well, I was just going to say, speaking of family, we haven't had any interruption so far, Catherine. I've actually been really impressed. No, no, how they're, long behaving. We've been. they're behaving. <laughs> they're behaving you haven't had any interruptions either nathan the handcuffs and the masking tape must be working so no just joking um but um but no i catherine i I just wanted to i mean i really found this conversation really fascinating and i i think what's been really refreshing um has been just seeing it through the lens of someone who's got that that, that l&d focus you know you've obviously had the journey through health health and safety and and still have that focus but having that additional l&d responsibility on a global level is is quite unique i mean i I don't think there's too many people that would have that responsibility based here in australia so yeah thank you so much for sharing both your career and also on on the areas that we covered it's been a really great chat catherine and i hope that uh has Sydney got any sort of update as to when they might be coming out of lockdown? What's the, what's the current update there? Well, actually, um, Nathan, I'll have to ch- I'll have to check the news because I we need that I need that daily update. But at this moment, um, we're supposed to get out of lockdown next week right. at the end of next week. So, um, but I I don't I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I think we're here for the for the longer term. So, yeah, it, it's it's a tough it is a tough time, and it does play on everybody's mental health and even my mental health. So, you know, um, yeah, uh, you know, please, please, I hope that things sort of um, you know close out so, shortly so we can get back to normality. No, I'm with you. I, th- I think I, I read you there in terms of people staying in touch with each other. And I, I jokingly said on my um, update uh, of, of my podcast uh, the other day or last week that, you know, kids, while they can be pretty infuriating when you're trying to work, they're also the most brilliant distraction. You know, it's, there's nothing better than going down and actually having that to, to, to mix up the day. But, uh, but look, um, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for everything you've provided on, on, the, on the chat today. I look forward to staying in touch with you and, and all the best with your continued career. At, at ABB. Thank you, Nathan. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much. All the best. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye.